Hello, and welcome to another episode of Disrupt Your Now, the show for entrepreneurs who are sick and tired of checking off the boxes and are ready to create their own boxes. Tonight, our guest, Cheryl Mason, and welcome, Cheryl, to the show, has, has created so many boxes, it's amazing. She is the first woman military spouse chairman of the Veterans Administration's Board of Appeals, and correct me if I said it all wrong, but that's an amazing accomplishment, either one of those, woman or military spouse, and being the first of both. And now she has a new book coming out. It's on pre-sale until the end of next week, and it'll be coming out at the beginning of the year called Dare to Relate, Leading with a Fierce Heart. And Cheryl, I want you, though, to tell the audience about your background, and then I want to talk more about your journey, and but let them know more about your background and how you got to where you are now, okay. and welcome well, to the show. Thanks, Lisa. I'm excited to be here. You know me. I'm, I'm a big fan, so um, Thank you. I stalk you regularly. Oh, um, that's sweet. So, uh, so a little bit about me. I don't want to give you the whole spiel, but um, I grew up in southern Ohio in the foothills of Appalachia. Um, mm -hmm. I lost both my father and my brother to suicide before mm -hmm. I was 18. Oh, wow. And yeah, it was not it was not easy. It was hard. Um, and then I, I became a military spouse. <laughs> um, I, I met and married my husband and, uh, he's air force retired and jumped into that frying pan. And <laughs> this was a time where, um, military spouses were really literally told you can't have a job. Your job is supporting your spouse yes. and they would hurt his career through their spouses. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, you know, I was raised by a very strong Rosie the Riveter type from World mm -hmm. War II, who awesome. told me I, I could do anything I wanted. So I did, and I am. Oh, and, that is so cool. And especially being from Appalachia, because people have this, my father's from there too. So not Ohio, Virginia, but yeah. people have this conception of what they think people are like. That's but exactly what they don't understand is how independent yeah <laughs> we're we're a little perseverance and very right. um yeah. so yeah so i i basically started carving my career while supporting my husband amazingly i could do that mm -hmm. and uh you know i supported his career we had uh, some children had two boys and you know i i found the department of veterans affairs you know i, I left and came back but you know it just the mission spoke to me uh especially my father was a world war ii veteran and you know mm -hmm. i i got benefits to go to school. And so um, wow. I really wanted to give back. And so I started climbing the ladder at the board. I never imagined um, chairman would be in my, in my, uh, in my mirror, in my, you know, front wind, windshield, but there mm -hmm. it was. Um, I, uh, you know, it was really funny. I was sitting in the office minding my own business one day, and we'd been working really hard on appeals modernization and a lot of things that were going on. And phone rang and, and this person said, um, you know, Miss Mason, this is so-and-so at the White House. We'd like to talk to you about um, being the next chairman. And I said, the chairman of what? <laughs> You're making some committee or something. <laughs> and they're like, um, the Board of Veterans Appeals. And I'm like, oh, sure. Um, oh, you think wow. I can get through Senate confirmation? And they said, you're a, you're a, you're a government employee. You'll be fine. Oh, that and, is uh, awesome. So that's what happened. And, you know, I was, I was just honored to be considered, to be nominated, and then to be confirmed by the Senate, um, you know, full, like, you know, <laughs> and awesome. then I took position and, you know, the board was, chat, was, was having a rough time when I took over. I mean, I had been there, but we hadn't had a chairman for seven years. And we when had, did you take over? To, uh, November of 2017. Okay. And I served until August of 2022. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it has had some challenges, but, you know, I, um, I, I did things a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had learned from my from my background, and so that's kind of what happened. And and then you know I retired, and here I am carving new pathways for myself. <laughs> that is so cool, and I and I have to say the fact that you did not have that dream that that wasn't what your goal was was to become the chair. Your goal was to give back. Mm -hmm. I think led you in a more valuable, helpful way, which ironically is what ended up getting you the position because you weren't worried about 
what everybody else is thinking and checking yeah. off the political boxes and stuff. Yeah. So that's a good lesson for people mm -hmm. right there. That is a good lesson to yeah. don't worry about that stuff. Worry about your job and the people that you're serving. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. So that's me. That's me in a nutshell. Um, you know, and, and now uh, I'm writing a book. I have a, I have a speaking and a consulting business. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're we're launching again. You know, as a military spouse, I had to remake myself a few times and 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 uh, adjust and pivot. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I I I will tell you, Lisa. I know you'll you'll enjoy this. Um, you know, when you're driving in NASCAR, you got to be ready for those. Those things that come flying at you. Well, yep. I'm a huge NASCAR fan. I've been to a, several races, and uh, you know, I believe in looking ahead, but paying attention to what's happening right in front of you. Yes, definitely. And you know, Colin and I were at a business conference, I don't know, a year or two ago, <clears throat> and he was being interviewed. Colin Garrett, for the people who yeah. aren't familiar, because there are a few people that maybe not. So it's race car driver I work with. And somebody asked him, because in NASCAR, you can't turn your head. And of course, yeah. you have no side view mirrors and yeah. all that. You have a spotter. And somebody said, well, what do you do when you're up in the corner and you're flying at 100 and whatever miles an hour and you're up in the corner and the car is in front of you, behind you, beside you? And he said, I just drive my car. Mm -hmm. And that was such a good analogy for business and everything else yeah. in life. Stop worrying about all the people around you, except for, I mean, obviously, there's some things you have to pay attention to have a team that you can rely on and the spotter have somebody who is like a mentor or a guide yeah. to you and worry about your own self instead of everybody else. That's and right. in his case, it gets him out alive. But in our cases, it helps us be successful and also helps us be happier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, well, um, so, uh, okay. I want you to tell the audience about the book. I'm so okay. excited about it. <laughs> so, yeah. So dare to le relate leading with a fierce heart. So when I retired, everybody was like, you have to write a book. And I was like, well, <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, okay. They said, you really have to tell your story. And, you know, I, I wanted to tell my mom's story. Um, uh -huh. And, and they said, well, we can put part of that in the book, but then you can do that for the next book. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> so I tell a little bit of her story, but I really like the first part of the book is really about overcoming those challenges that happen to you. Yeah. Um, life, life is full of them. It throws them at you, ready or not. And so, like I said, I, you know, I, I, I'm a suicide loss survivor um, and I'm from Appalachia. Appalachia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those two things um could work against each other because yeah. the the Appalachian people we yeah. are a fierce independent you know persevering people but we don't like change yes and we don't like things we don't understand well mental mm -hmm. health and suicide are not something that we understood in the late 60s and 70s yeah. so <clears throat> there was a little bit of um you know uh, overcoming that and learning where your support was and and mm -hmm. so I started learning. I wanted to like, you know, hide. And my mom was having none of that. So, well, but I learned for her because I know my. I'll tell you in a minute. But my family went through it, and we didn't hide. But I know what you're talking about. There, yeah. You yeah. just, you just, you know, you just, you want to make it easier on people, but at the same yeah. time, you want to make it easier on you. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I watched and I saw the people that supported us, and I saw the importance of relationships. And then, mm -hmm. you know, then I went on to become a military spouse. And I again faced challenges as as a young military spouse in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The the military had a very different viewpoint um, yeah. about spouses having careers. And um, like you were, I was told you can't have one. You're not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, my response was, watch me. Because <laughs> 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 um, it didn't make any sense to me. Like, why can't we both have careers? I can support my spouse. And, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, so so the first part of the book is really about seeing those challenges and learning from them. Instead mm -hmm. of hiding in the corner, using those challenges to learn and grow and figure out how to use them going forward. Yeah. And then the, the middle section of the book has some, some uh, discussions around like imposter syndrome, why leading is different now than maybe it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, 
thinking about how you do that, like, you know, how you do that. And then the end of the book wraps up with some pointers. I call them, uh, you know, skills and tools for your leadership toolbox. My, my father was a carpenter. And so one of the things, one of the earliest memories I have um, with him was in his, in his, um, in his shack, in his carpenters, he was a foreman on a job. He, he would always say, now you have to know the, to, how to use the tool properly and you have to be skilled to use it. And so I think that's the same for leaders. Yeah. And because the world has changed with COVID and, and many other things over the past 20 some years, leaders aren't as skilled because they're not taught really yeah. how to lead through <laughs> Um, connecting and caring and investing in your people first because they want to focus on results. So that's what yeah. the book's about. I love it. That is so awesome. And I love that you pull your parents into it and use those everyday things as analogies yeah. for what's going on. And the thing about leaders, it's like, so historically leaders weren't taught any of that because you were just there to lead and tell people what to do or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you throw on top of it the internet and, you know, um, distributed society and remote workers and COVID and everything else. And they're really, really unprepared. Yeah. And so it's, it's like, it's if they, and if they don't catch up with the times and learn from you and people like you, not only will their career suffer, but their companies will suffer. So and, you're... And yeah, we have to grow. We have to grow the leaders behind us. I mean, so the book is really for aspiring leaders as well as current leaders who want to learn, but yeah. also to help those leaders grow and say, you can do this and you can do it your way. And, and that's another really great point because a lot of the younger people aren't learning leadership skills because they don't have face to face time with people. Yeah. And, you know, some of the people at Racing for Heroes, for example, that like I've talked about earlier, they train special forces before they deploy in tactical mobility and stuff like that. And they said, ironically, one of the biggest things they have to help with is soft skills, people skills. Yep. And yep. because unlike when we grew up on, um, they just, you know, they're just not, they don't have the everyday in, interpersonal relationships as much as yep. we did. And then of course you have that through school, but then that was ripped away during COVID. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to tell you, so um, speaking of your father and your um, brother, my grandfather committed suicide when I was five. So 1966. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, my grandmother tried to. Now, she did mm -hmm. not succeed, but they lived next door to us. And so mm -hmm. we spent she lived like, I guess, 30 more years, almost 30 more years. Mm -hmm. And she was OK, even though she shot herself in the head. It was just the angle that it went through. Um, and they told her, it, this is so weird. And then I'm going to get back on the track. They told my mother because of the area of her brain that the bullet hit, she would not be depressed anymore. And she oh, wasn't for wow. about 10 years. Oh my. And then it gradually started coming back. And that, that was amazing. But um, even though that wasn't my father and my brother, it's, it's something that you live with and you can let it destroy you or you can mm -hmm. learn from it. Yes. And it's one of those things that I was like, no matter what, I'm going to overcome this, you know? Yes. And, but I also know that things were a lot different than when we were little girls and we live in a small town and we'd go out and I'll never forget one day these women were like, this woman was whispering to those are the little girls who's, mm -hmm. yep. and we're, you know, all, all the time. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I know what you mean with that, even though it's not the same situation, very similar. Yeah, so. but it's in it's in the family. And, you know, I mean, that's that's one thing that I will say about suicide that a lot of people don't understand. I think we've made huge inroads, but people still need to understand this. And and I'm pretty passionate and I speak about mm -hmm. it. It is it's suicide. Mental health and suicide are are can be like cancer and heart disease. Yes. You most people these days um, know their risk for mm -hmm. heart disease, cancer, other other diseases. But you don't know your risk for suicide. And when you yeah. have suicide in your family, you are at higher risk. That's true. You have to know it's, that. it's very true. And there are also studies that show when somebody commits suicide that it's something like an average of 150 people are affected right mm -hmm. then because it's not yeah. just their family and friends, but their community, their church. 
everything. And so that ripple effect, but the generational ripple effect mm -hmm. also, the kids, the grandchildren, yeah. you know, the, we've, we've had younger generations in our family who have struggled. And yeah. we, we don't know that much always, about grandpa. Yeah, I, I mean, I have two sons <laughs> and they have known their history of mm -hmm. their grandfather and their uncle since for a while, yeah. because it's something you have to talk about and you have to be aware of because dying by suicide is not, you know, a lot of people have feelings, have strong feelings about it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a hard situation. And in my family, you know, my father had a, a significant mental health issue. He was um, adult onset schizophrenia that had the oh, war, wow. war II, mm -hmm. um made some things worse for him. But mm -hmm. my brother was a different um, situation. Again, mental health, but different, right? Yeah. yeah. So that doesn't, you know, it, it's still there. And so yeah. that's what people have to understand. That's right. It's still there. And I'm like you, my kids knew. And yeah. we talked about it very openly because otherwise, how could they ever come to us? Right. And, and, and in uh, leadership, you have to do the same thing. I said, yeah. you know, in my situation, you know, I, like we were saying, I not only had a personal, but I had a professional. So, um, you know, I, I led through a suicide situation. Oh, wow. And, it was extremely hard, but I was front and center and very visible because my, my team, my, mm -hmm. the people that were my employees and, and the person that we lost, I mean, they all needed me. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I knew what, what everybody was kind of going through. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I was privileged to be a VA. And so one of my first phone calls was the crisis team. Yeah. And so they came in and supported my team. But um, it still was a very, very hard, hard process. And, you know, that's one of those things. That's a great example of something, how something terrible and awful that we go through in our life, though, that we learn from. And you were able to take your sad, horrible experience, but take that and help people. Yes. And that's just amazing. And if there had been somebody else in your position, I, I'm sure that they would not have been able to deal with it as well as you because they wouldn't have known how people were feeling. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, but that's kind of what the book is about, too, is, is that's a different style of leadership is understanding yeah. the impact of that or, you know, just, you know, everyday struggles. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I, in my recent TED talk, one of the examples I give is, you know, sometimes, you know, what if you have a boss who understands the washing machine broke, the dog has to go to the vet, the child's sick, or you need a mental health day because mm -hmm. all of those things are important. And when you yes. have a boss who understands that, then you feel valued. Yeah. And I have to say somebody who's very, very close to me, who does work for the government a couple months ago was having a real issue at work. And her, her boss said, take a mental health day. Mm -hmm. I can tell that you need it. So yeah. it's really, it's amazing how a lot of, in a lot of ways, um, the government is ahead of corporations, I believe, in that area, I think. In some places, it depends. Yeah. And this was the military and that was the VA. Yeah. So maybe that's why, you yeah. know, because because those agencies, those departments, everything have had to. Ryan Garrett is on here. When we were talking about suicide, he said, that's exactly why we're so passionate about what we do at eleven eleven Generations yeah. of Impact. That that's ripple right. effect, people just don't understand it. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just love the topic of your book because not only is it helpful to leaders in corporations, but it's helpful in everyday life. It's helpful in your family life, mm -hmm. your community. And people don't understand. A lot of people don't understand that leadership is across the board. Yeah. You lead from where you sit. You, you yeah. really do. You don't have to be the CEO, politically appointed, whatever. You really yeah. lead from where you sit. And I think, you know, even even in, in our engagements daily, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. those are leadership opportunities or just opportunities to impact somebody else. And, and you know, we as a society for a while have forgotten that people who provide services are people. Yes. Um, just like employees are people. Mm -hmm. And so when you see them as people and you value them as people, 
that makes a difference. And so that's, that's exactly yeah. what, what I talk about, because I think it's important, you know, many leaders are trained and taught that you, you go for results and mm -hmm. results are great. Um, but if, if you don't take care of your people, your employees, they are your most valuable resource. I mean, they're, you know, you, you have to fight to keep them, especially mm -hmm. these days, because, you know, uh, people have choices and most organizations and companies are in a war on talent to try to retain. And so if you retain your people and they feel valued and, and heard, Mm -hmm. um, then they're going, they're going to stay and they're going to take care of the results. And, and that's, you know, one of the things in the book I talk about, and this is the other piece that people wanted me to write about, uh, you know, while I valued people and I took care and I invested in the people who were my employees, we blew the, re we blew the doors off the results. Wow. We Can doubled you share can you share some of those with us? Sure, sure. So the first year, um, I when I stepped into the role, the board had done fifty-five thousand decisions um, through the previous end of the year, which and is that's appeal decisions, right? Appeals decisions yeah. for okay. veterans, right? Okay. And I think we had done. I think the most we had done was around fifteen or sixteen thousand. Wow. Hearings. And, you know, so hearings, because the board's mission was both <laughs> hearings or is both hearings and decisions, right? So. Yeah. Um, and we also had $42 million from Congress that was to be used to hire people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm walking in going, okay, what? You know? And I mean, I knew because I was there, but I yeah. wasn't, you know, it wasn't my thing mm -hmm. to run. So now it's yeah. sitting on my shoulders. So we did a huge hiring push, but at the same time, I was very visible. And mm -hmm. so I walked around because it was pre-COVID. I had some staff that were virtual, remote you know, teleworking, but mm -hmm. I had some stuff in this, in the office building. And so I would walk around and talk and I was walking around one day and a young man came up to me and said, do you have a minute, ma'am? He was very nervous. And I said, absolutely. And he says, I have an idea to share with you. By the time he got finished talking, I had my phone in my hand and I said, we're putting you on my schedule. Oh, I have goosebumps. So we put him on my schedule and I tell the story in the TED talk. I tell it in the book. This man, this this young man is is an MIT engineer and an attorney, and he had developed a technology solution that we implemented uh, rather quickly. And, you know, those things don't happen quickly. But once we started sharing it and, and showcasing what it could do, everybody wanted it. And so mm -hmm. the first year, Lisa, the first year we improved output by 50, five zero. Wow. I mean, oh my and God. I, you know. It, the people did it. I just gave them a tool. Yes, right? yes. Uh, but I but I listened, and it was an employee-driven solution. We did mm -hmm. train the trainer. He trained, and his friends trained. And, you know, he and a team had developed it, and they, they did it. And that kind of thing kept happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so the next year, you know, so by the time we – so the first year we did 50%, and then the next year – the next three, three to four years – Every year I was chairman, we did between 95 to 100,000 decisions. And wow. the last year, the last two years, we doubled the number of hearings. And the way we mm -hmm. did that was, again, innovation. One of the things I had asked for walking in the door, because I had been, you know, watching and listening, mm -hmm. was virtual telehearings, which enable, which, you know, veterans can use these things right here. Yeah. For or their laptops, mm -hmm. but we didn't have that. We didn't have that capability, but, to, oh but EHA did. Uh -huh. And so I just went to IT and said, I need it. And it <laughs> took them about a year, year and a half. And we rolled it out just at the beginning of COVID. We had to make people comfortable with it, show them how to use it. But, mm -hmm. you know, by the time we got it up and running, it took off. And, That's um, awesome. And it's so cool because y'all were already working on this. You saw the need and it just so happened to be launched like right at, around the beginning of COVID. Yeah. And if you hadn't had that in place, imagine the negative effects within the organization. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, we had a slowdown, you know, during COVID anyway, because of exams on the, yeah. on the veterans benefits side, but we could still do the hearings and decisions where, when we could. And, um, mm -hmm. and, but the, the, the biggest thing that I loved out of it was 
I had been a judge for several years and I had done in-person hearings in the field as well as in DC, as well as some videos. Mm -hmm. And I knew, cause at that time veterans had to travel to the regional office to do their hearings. In some states that's four to eight hours. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. stressful on them to, to travel. Mm -hmm. It's stressful on, you know, they, they get very nervous. Yeah. And so by doing it this way, Right. Can be expensive. Expensive. right. Mm -hmm. And so by this way, they can do it in the comfort of their home. And if they need technology help, they could have a family member assist them, whomever. And so we delivered the judge to them. Oh, wow. Said. And that was, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it's all about is, is, and I also was able to take care of my people because when we had snowstorms or other things, I had people driving in 20 inch snowstorms in DC to wow. come in to do a hearing. And, you know, you can't, can't yeah. do that either, but you don't want to cancel it. So this way, mm -hmm. I was able to take care of take care of our customers and um, you know care for for our employees and, and make it better. And it had the byproduct of enabling us to blow the doors off our recruiting capability too. Wow, so. <laughs> those are amazing achievements. And I want to remind the audience that when you're talking about those tens of thousands of decisions, every one of those is a person. person. Every it's not person. just this thing out there. Everyone is a person. It's a veteran with like a family mm -hmm. yeah. who's, yeah. who's who's either trying to get benefits, you know, to to take care of themselves mm -hmm. to to make up the difference, or they're trying to get benefits to ensure that they can get health care through VA. Yeah. And so yeah. those are extremely important um, for mm -hmm. our veteran community. And so each each case to me was was a single person because mm -hmm. that's how I saw them. I love that. And I also love that the, that, that MIT graduate had enough faith in you to, even though he was nervous, he at least felt like he could approach you with it. And that means a lot to me because one of the things that I stress to my clients is that you have to learn to allow or teach if they don't know your employees how to think creatively, how to think entrepreneurially, because then they can come up with some of the best ideas that you'll ever have. And they'll be more fulfilled in their job. They're happier. They feel needed. And like in this case, not only did it help the ripple, in this case, the ripple effects were so positive, but then it also helped y'all recruit more people. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, if you're not letting or allowing or helping people to to have input like that um he, really he told me yourself. yeah he actually told me it was because i was in the hall walking around and he 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 felt that i was approachable yeah. and he was you know he was nervous but he was comfortable because i was there yeah and, because you're yeah. a real person standing yeah. there in front of him where if you were up in your ivory tower and he right. had to send you an email or something right. that and, wasn't going to happen yeah, right. and and because when people have to to um when they have to approach you like that, they get no immediate like physical feedback or anything to be able to adapt their approach. So they just don't even do it because it's too scary. And you know, I mean, the nice thing is, you know, you build these relationships. I would walk around, and so you know, I knew who had kids, who had who had parents yeah. living with them, who liked who liked wine, who, who liked to travel, who played golf, who ran marathons, you know, you, you create, you don't have to know everything. You don't need to know yeah. somebody's personal life, but you don't also don't have to pretend like you don't have one. I mean, they knew I had two kids. They mm -hmm. knew I had a dog, you know, they knew my mom lived with me, you know, mm -hmm. when I first started. And, you know, I mean, those are, those are things that, you know, it, it makes you a person to them and, yes. and because you are treating them like a person. And when you are working with corporations now on their leadership, you're like teaching them how to be people because so many people in the corporate world are like, okay, I can't show any emotion. I can't let anybody know that I'm anything but buttoned up and strong, you know? Right. Well, I, and, I advise, I, I advise them. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, use that word, but I mean, See, and I don't mean that disparagingly on them, but I think it's so cool and it's so freeing also that when people understand that they don't have to be this untouchable 
king no. or queen. Because that's it, not what that's not what the people who work for you want. They want yeah. you to be approachable. They want, you know, I mean, one of the stories from the book is I talk about Southwest Airlines. And, you know, they were one of the leaders up there with Google. Well, Southwest, I mean, <laughs> they were amazing. <laughs> like they were out when they started this company, they would go have drinks with the pilots and the customers and the uh, the, mm -hmm. the flight attendants and get the feedback, you know, so they'd walk into the bar where, they're, where the people who were their employees were mm -hmm. and sit down next to them and start talking to them and say, yeah. tell me what's what. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, remarkable, but that's yeah. part of the reason they're still successful today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Southwest. That's who I fly all the time if I can, because it's just so laid back and you know. So it's fun cool. when you get on there. They're uh, they're 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 uh, you know their their customer service people are fantastic. Mm -hmm. They always yeah. Always know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Um. So and, oh, and I you also you play a lot of golf, right? <laughs> I'm still working up to that. Um, so I, you know, our, our youngest is a professional golf instructor oh. in, in Northern Virginia. So you would think, you know, I would, I would be good. Um, but you know, that job got in the way for a while, but yeah. I, I do play occasionally. I'm, I'm working, mm -hmm. working my game back up to something. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, my husband plays and he'll still walk 18 holes, even though he's in his seventies, but, um, he, <laughs> But I don't ever play enough to get good because I never have time. So my thing of playing is I'll walk with him, but I'll hit my ball until he gets his in and then, or I'll hit mine several times. You know, I look at it as practice what I'm playing with him. Well, that's, but. both of our sons play, but the youngest is is the real golfer. And, uh, you know, he learned, he started learning at, at three because we would have date night where we'd go play nine holes and oh, cool. the kids would crash, <laughs> crash date yeah. night. <laughs> That's cool though. Ryan has a, a question. He says the TED Talk is a huge honor. What was the process like from getting the call to presentation day? Ignore uh -huh. me if covered this. No, we didn't, we haven't covered it yet, Ron. So I'm glad you asked. So yeah, thanks, Ryan. It's a it's a TEDx. And so I've had a couple of people asking, like, how'd you get a TED Talk so quick? Well, it's mm -hmm. first of all, it's a TEDx. So TEDx. it's a little different. So explain that to people who don't know. So a TED Talk is like you you can apply for it. It's it's you you're going to the big stage, it's on YouTube. TEDx, there are there are different different areas and companies and organizations that do TEDx through their mm -hmm. organization. Yeah. And so I had retired, um, so it's a little bit smaller stage. Sometimes Big Ted picks you up. That's yeah. what we call Big Ted. Big Ted. Um, picks you up or they'll push it to, to the Big Ted if they think it's something they want to see. So mm -hmm. what happened in my situation was I had retired from VA, but VA TEDx uh, reached out to me and said, mm -hmm. you know, we'd, we'd really, we'd like to invite you to to present and, you know, you have to go, you have to submit all this information about mm -hmm. what you present on and things like that. And I said, well, you know, I'm retired. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so they said, we have some outside, you know, we have some insider and outside people. It's a way for them to showcase and, and teach. Mm -hmm. So, so it was accepted. And um, that's just like a process of talking about what you're going to talk about yeah. and you kind of give them an outline and then they have a they have a team that meets and they decide whether or not to accept you even with the tedx because big ted does that bigger yeah i think with big with the with ted i think you actually have to submit a video i didn't have to submit a video mm -hmm. but they also knew me they had seen me speak for a while at the end yeah. so um so so once i was was um accepted then i had to start working on my subject matter well you know, it just so happened I was writing a book. <laughs> so <laughs> they kind of came together. And um, you, know, you have about, you know, you can't really go over 18 minutes. They prefer mm -hmm. you somewhere between, you know, 13 and 15. Yeah. Um, for, for, and it's all memorized. Even if you have slides, you have slides there you can use. I don't, I don't, I didn't use slides. Um, but you can have slides, not a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you run through it, you practice, you practice, you practice with, with your, your supporters, people who are helping you through the TED process, mm -hmm. and then they will tweak you and, you know, give you feedback. And um, then when they, you know, you, you, they, they give you the date, you have to be drop dead ready. So my date was sometime at the end of August, because we shot it um, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. September, and it will be available uh, in December. But 
Um, so then it's, you know, it's going to the location and, you know, <laughs> that's nerve wracking. I mean, I've spoken a lot. I mean, as chairman, yeah. I did 30 plus maybe mm -hmm. 50 speaking engagements a year, virtual and in person. But this is a different ball game when you, when you walk on that red dot. Oh, yeah. um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, once I got there and, you know, I, I was on the dot, I was good to go because I had rehearsed it, but you have to rehearse. You, re you should also always rehearse in front of people, get mm -hmm. their feedback, make sure that you know kind of what your face is doing. My face is not always, you know, agreeable with the rest <laughs> of me. <laughs> and so trying to practice like the right, you know, when the right words, the right, the right, you know, facial expressions, make yeah. sure that you're gestures and presenting the gestures because you yeah. can't move around a lot. So, right. Because they want you on that dot. They want you on the dot. In <laughs> Ryan paces when he speaks. I do too. If I'm at it, so he paces. So, Ryan, you got to stay on that dot when you, yeah, you got to stand up. You can move around, but pacing, no, they don't want you, yeah. you know, and I have one, there's one Besides. piece where I, where I stand, you know, and mm -hmm. I kind of do the Wonder Woman pose. So, you know, yeah. you want to make sure that's effective. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when I say pace, you know, he meanders around the stage. Around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and I want to ask you, so a friend of mine is um, one of the founders of TEDx Tyson's and she had told me um, that a lot of times the people who speak, they'll come in and they have an idea of what they want to speak on but it ends up that once they like interview them or whatever, they're like, yeah, but that's okay. But no, that's not what people want to hear. But when they learn more about them, they're like, this is what we want you to talk right. about. And they're like, no, but I want to talk about this. And they're like, yeah, but nobody cares about that. And right. I wondered what, did you go through any of that or what they already knew you and knew what to expect? So you probably didn't. Um, just a little, I, I did a little bit. I had to tighten it up. A little mm -hmm. bit, you know, because I was, you know, again, writing the book, which is a completely different process than the TEDx. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when I first kind of was practicing, you know, they said, no, this is good, but you need to tighten it and you need to bring it, you know, let's let's tighten it up a little bit. And then one of the last things they told me as we were practicing, I was practicing in July and I kind of had most of it down. They said, so you need three takeaways. And I went, okay. oh, mm -hmm. yes, I do. <laughs> so, so then I had to kind of revamp things a little bit and change it. So really what they wanted me to focus on was was to really mirror the book a little bit. Um, was And just, you know, I, the fact that I was writing a book just kind of coincided with it. But mm -hmm. um, they, they really wanted me to showcase my history, my background, and uh, overcoming the challenges. And then stepping into a leadership role and what that was like and mm -hmm. and then you know leading um differently unconventionally differently mm -hmm. and so that that was really what they wanted the focus on so you know made okay. for a quick 15 minutes yeah <laughs> well that's that's really interesting because i've watched a bunch of them and i've talked to my friend who did it but i haven't i can't remember if i've ever talked to anybody and asked them those questions like that, what the process was like for you. I was but. really nervous before I walked on the stage, but once I walked on the stage, I was good. And it's amazing that you were nervous as much as you have spoken and in as in as in front of as many people as you have. Oh, it's yeah. amazing that you were nervous, but yeah, it's a well, different situation. It's a different situation. And you know, I think like I said in in one of the posts when one of the posts I had on social media, I think I was also more nervous because I wasn't you know, when I first started speaking as chairman, you know, I was representing the board of VA. Yeah, that was a big, that was nerve wracking. But, but, you know, I had one, I had slides and I had notes. Yeah. Um, but this time it's me, right? Yeah. It's my story. It's more personal. And so I think that's why for me, it was, it was, um, <clears throat> I was more nervous, but uh, the audience was fantastic. They were very supportive, and I got great feedback afterwards. They 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 thought it was great. Somebody somebody asked me if I was a professional speaker, so I, I figured I must have done something right. So kazoo tight. Sorry, I'm <laughs> I know your allergies are acting up. It's that time of uh, year. I muted my mic because my cough. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you. I'm going to ask you something else so I can mute my mic again. Uh, were, were you in front of an audience? Yes. When they, okay. 
Yeah, so there's a live, they bring in a live audience and, and you know, there's other speakers as well as some some other people around and you could have guests. I didn't didn't really want any guests. <laughs> so I knew I knew some people in the audience as it was. And and the other thing is I didn't watch the other speakers before me because they kind of have a lineup mm -hmm. and we were down there for three days and I did I went the first day in the afternoon and I was like, I can't watch anybody before me. And it was really funny because one of the leaders of the TEDx said, yeah, we're going to make that a thing because it, it made other people nervous. I and think that's, yeah. yeah, I think if I had been you, I would do the same thing <laughs> because then you start judging yourself. You do because you're just naturally going to compare. And so uh, I want to everything that you're going to say exactly. or do or how you're how you speak and everything. Right. And, you know, you, you can have similar topics. <laughs> yeah. but it's not your story. I mean, that was mm -hmm. one of the challenges I had with the book when I was first starting to write the book. I, you know, had a little that it, those imposter gremlins like to come visit and oh, they sit yeah. on your shoulder and they say, oh, you don't you know, you have no business doing this. And, you know, I was you know, the book is about people. It's not about me. It's about people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was really struggling. And um, I had this from, excuse me, two, two or three different people. One was my editor and then a couple of a mentor and a friend both said, they all said the same thing to me. They said, no, this is your story and nobody can tell your story like you. And it's about impacting. Mm -hmm. And so, and that hit me because my, my, my mission statement is purpose, mm -hmm. impact, value. Mm -hmm. Um, so w whether, you know, whatever I do, whether it's working with other organizations, whether I'm on a board, whether I'm speaking, I want to make sure that I'm being purposeful, that I'm, that I'm bringing impact and that I add value. And that's okay. just, yeah. Yeah. That's really exciting. I want to ask you, what has been the hardest part for you about writing the book? Aside from maybe imposter syndrome. Yes, yeah, so aside from the little gremlins. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, you know, writing is hard. And, you know, once I, you know, when they first told me, they said, oh, for your rough draft, you have to have, you know, between 35 and 40,000 words. I'm like, I don't have that many words. <laughs> it came in, mm -hmm. People who know me are like, yeah, right. <laughs> but it came in about 38,000 words in the rough draft. Um, okay. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that part and learning to kind of bring in others and interview them and, and help and have them help tell the stories from their mm -hmm. stories is important. <laughs> And I, so I learned that, but I will tell you, I think the hardest thing about writing the book is marketing it. Yes, <laughs> I agree. That is it the was. hardest thing because you're not prepared. I was not anywhere prepared for that. Well, and, and, and I have to tell you, I know a lot of writers who are published by the big mm -hmm. houses and have been for years and it's still, they don't do the marketing even for mm -hmm. people like that. Yeah. And so I know a lot yeah. of people <clears throat> who even though they've been New York Times bestsellers for decades, who are starting to self-publish because they're like, okay, if I got to do all the work mm -hmm. and if I self-publish, I can put whatever I want in there at the beginning and the end and whatever. I don't have to worry about, you know, so it's amazing how much things are, ha are changing, but it's not just for the little guys like us. Marketing is a pain for all of them. Yeah, well, I I did a hybrid process, so I own the book, I own the content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have I have help through the process. Um, you know, and they've been teaching me about marketing as much as you can teach a mm -hmm. lawyer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm working on it. I'm you know I've got about a week and a half to go, and about uh, uh, I need 25 more copies sold to hit my goal. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> okay, all right, everybody watching, we gotta get we gotta put. Pump it out and get people to to order it. It's going to be great. I know we can sell twenty five more. <laughs> um, well, you get all these great perks with it. You know, you get a signed copy. You get your name printed in the book. Um, you get a sneak peek. You can get a launch ticket. There's, you know, you can have dinner or play golf. You know, with me and my husband. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's options for all of that. And, or, yeah, I think that's. I think that is really cool that you did that. I didn't sign up for that. I just got the book because <laughs> I'm like, 
because with everything I have going on, I figured I wouldn't be able to get there. To play, well, it's, but. it's, you know, it's not till the book publishes, but I've had, a, I've had a couple of people sign up for, for those, which, you know, it's either in DC or down here in Pinehurst. So, you know, if you want to come down and play golf. That's really cool. I love it. And Ron, if you're still there listening, <laughs> that's similar to what I was talking about with Ron today about Colin. Yeah, well, on the driver, some things we're going to be doing with him. Yeah, I think it's I think it's cool. And the other thing I did was I also did if you buy a certain number of books, you also get me as a speaker. Yes, um, you know because I think that you know putting the books in somebody's hand to help make an impact and help them think about you know mm -hmm. the type of leader they want to be or become mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah, you know, I can talk all day long. <laughs> uh, Ron says he'll take five. I'll send you the link, Ron. Actually, okay. Great. Thank you. I think I actually have it in the description <laughs> for the that show. Would, Ryan, that will make you a silver, uh, a silver uh, package, which means you get your logo and website in the book. Ooh, awesome. Cool. But yeah, I, Ryan, I believe that the link is in the description, but I'll check. If it's not, I'll add it in the comments, but I think it is. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> tell us about the consulting business, how that's going and you probably, do you even have time to think about it with the book right now? <laughs> well, you know, that was the funny thing. You know, I retired from VA eight months ago and, you know, everybody's like, what are you going to do? People are like, mm -hmm. write the book, do this, do that. And so, um, and I didn't want to take, everybody's like, you need to take some downtime. Well, you know, <laughs> first one, anybody who knows me and Lisa, we've talked about this. I have ADHD. So <laughs> I you know, just down Downtime for somebody with ADHD is like double double time. So, you know, some people it's going to take four months. I took like three weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that was enough. Um, so, so I thought, well, you know, I'll go ahead and start writing the book and I'll go ahead and, and start consulting. And so I connected with a couple of consulting firms and, you know, let them know I was available. And, you know, I thought, you know, that'll take some time. And then I also at the same time was, was, was getting my, business logo um, designed in my website, which was all done by military spouses. Cause I, oh, nice. so oh. yes, pictures, logo, website, all of it. That's uh, great. All, all military spouse supported oh. um, cause that's how I roll. Um, okay. And so, uh, so I was getting, I was having that done. I was working on all that. And so I started getting little, you know, little pieces of interest. And then, you know, I was about, I'd say I was about a month into writing a book and one of my client, one of my now clients called and said, so I want to bring you on for six months to do some leadership efficiency and some other training. Oh, cool. And um, they're like, can you give me a proposal? And I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And um, so, so they accepted it. So that kind of kicked off and you know so then that kept me a little busy and then i got a couple of their clients here and there and then um this summer as i was i launched the website <clears throat> and as i launched the website i had two other people approach me and say hey we'd like to work with you are you available to kind of give us this this number of hours uh, to start right. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, so I consult on leadership. I do consult on, you know, claims and appeals. I, I do not represent at all. No representation. Yeah. Uh, one, I can't. <laughs> it's in my mm -hmm. ethics agreement. But two, I, that's not what I want to do. We have, we have great veteran service organizations and, mm -hmm. um, you know, other <laughs> organizations out there doing that great work. So I, I leave mm -hmm. that to them, but I do come alongside and support them and help them out. That's um, awesome. And so, so I do, I do help in those areas. And um, then I also do uh, consulting and advising on suicide prevention and awareness as well as speaking about it from a leadership piece. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And so part of, part of the consulting business is also the leadership speaking business. Mm -hmm. So the, <clears throat> the first client <clears throat> that wanted the six months, are you like doing very specific things like certain days of the week or are you like a trusted advisor that they call whenever they need help or is it a combination combination so i'm mm -hmm. i'm a trusted advisor and so if i hear or see something as i'm doing some things i let mm -hmm. them know or, or we have some meetings but i also um do some training so okay. i'll be i'll be doing a training event next week for them mm -hmm. uh, where i'll be speaking 
And, um, you know, so, and then I think I have two more trainings before the end of the contract and, and they're, they're looking at extending me. Um, That's great. Yeah. And when you do the training, I'm just curious. So tell yeah. me if, if you don't want to answer when you do the training, or are you doing it virtually? You go there or a combination? Um, for, for the one next week, mm -hmm. I think I've got a little delay. Sometimes my yeah. internet gets crazy. Okay. Um, so uh, it's that North Carolina internet. Um, so so oh, I've done yeah. one, virtu one virtual. Did I lose we you? We still have a delay. Okay. I, I'm good, but are we back? You there? Can you hear me? I'm here. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Oh, now I can again. Good. Okay. You're back. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I've done one virtual, but um, the others have been in person. The one next week will be in person. Our okay. Travel. That's great. Well, I'm so excited for you. Thank Don't you. you love, I know you loved your work and you did many different things through the whole journey, but everything you get to start new is a new chapter. It's so much fun, isn't it? It is. And, you know, it was really funny. A friend of mine uh, I ran into at a military spouse event and she's a retired senior spouse. And um, I, I said, you know, I don't know about this. I th said, I think I'm failing at retirement. She said, you're not failing. <laughs> you're just re re you're just refocusing what retirement is for you. Yeah. And I, exactly. I love that. So I, I think, you know, I can't fully retire. You know, I, I just that wouldn't work for me. So that's and, how I you know, am. Yeah, I cannot I, imagine ever fully retiring just because I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And so I would be doing it anyway, even if I weren't, you know what I'm saying? Right. I just do what I do. And yeah. <clears throat> it's not war. It doesn't feel like work to me. Right. And I still have such a heart for um, veterans and, and the military community, military spouses. I sit on several boards. That's where I give a lot of my time to there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, the other the other stuff is just, you know, if people people want me to come speak. I'm, I'm happy to consider it. I've got a couple of um, people talking to me right now about we're booking, starting to book speaking engagements into 2024. So Yay. that's exciting. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, <clears throat> I advise my clients, I work with a lot of clients who are getting ready to retire or have retired and like want to plan their next chapter. And one of the things I, I always tell them now, I've owned my business for 33 years, believe it or not. I know. But I my business is different every single year. It's constantly evolving according to what my life is like at the time, what mm -hmm. I'm interested in and everything else. And so that's what I advise people, unless you're like opening some type of business, like a retail establishment yeah. or something like that. If you're, you know, going into your own thing, it's consulting and stuff. Don't box yourself in. Yeah. And I'm talking not just you, but to in, I know that yeah. you already know this, but to anybody listening, don't box yeah. yourself in because it's your business and you can make it anything you want. And yep. what you want this year might be different than next year. Yeah. Pro proactively pivot. Yes. <laughs> so I want you to tell people um, how they can find out more about you, um, how they can order your book. And I know that's all in the same place. And also about if they are interested in booking you. Okay. Um, so, so I, I think we have the links for you, but um, so first of all, you can always follow me or link with me on LinkedIn. I am Cheryl, uh, parentheses, Sherry Mason on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You will see my photo um, there. Uh, that also has the connection to my website. My website is Catalyst. It's C-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T, leadership, all one word. Mm -hmm. uh, these all these words all work together. They're all jammed <laughs> together. MGMT.com. That's okay. the website. And if you go to that website, you can book me. You can find out more about the book. It has the link to the book. Um, the book, I think we have the link, but as you said, it's through manuscripts. It's a very long link. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if, if you, again, if you follow me on LinkedIn, or Facebook, you can find me on either one, or Instagram, um, then, or you go to the website, uh, you can, you can find me, you can follow me, and everything's available to, to find me. If you want to book me, um, you can go to the website, or you can just reach out to me on LinkedIn, and we can talk about it, I'll, I'll give you, you know, give you my email, we can chat. Okay, well, and I highly recommend to y'all that you follow Cheryl on, on LinkedIn, because she has really interesting posts, and you never know who you might who she's connected to that you might see some posts that you wouldn't see otherwise. 
So go I'm follow a, her, connect with her on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm a big facilitator too. I like to connect people. So if you see somebody you're interested in connecting and you tell me a little bit about yourself, Lisa, you know this, I, I connect mm -hmm. people all over the place. So happy to do that. And I very much appreciate everybody's support and encouragement. I'm so grateful for the support for the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. I've, been, I've really enjoyed having you on. It's been great to talk with you. I appreciate your time. And I will see everybody else here next week. Great. Thanks, Thanks y'all. Bye.